to Mark chapter 4. No, chapter 14. I need to put glasses on. I was just deliberating whether I could get away without them. We're going to read from Mark chapter 14. We read from this last week and we saw in the opening verses from uh, 1 to 11 that uh, Mark brings before us um, a holy sandwich, a holy sandwich that in the first part there, uh, there are those who are plotting to take the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, faithless people. And then in the second part, there was a lady who had great faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who sought to anoint his body uh, for burial. And then in the last part, we returned in Mark's sandwich to the base layer, as it were, the middle part, the filling of the sandwich. We returned to the base part, which was Judas, faithless, selling his faith for some money and willing to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. So that was what we considered last week in verses 1 to 11. Now we come to verse 12, and I have a heading in my Bible, reading from the NIV this morning. I wanted to change it, actually, and read from the ESV this morning. But then uh, when I looked, and, and I was going to use the ESV tonight, when I looked, the NIV was better for this evening's reading, and uh, the ESV was better for this morning. And I thought that would confuse you all. So we have the NIV both morning and evening and this, this week. So uh, because we'll be reading from uh, the same chapter. You got that? Good. <laughs> uh, this morning we're reading from verse uh, 12. And the word of God says this. Just a small section this morning, 12 to uh, verse 16. Word of God, Mark 14 and verse 12. On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city. The man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters. The teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared to pass over. And so reads God's holy word. One time I was employed as a painter. Don't employ me to be your painter because I'm not a very good painter. It was to paint some outside walls. And as I was painting the outside walls, having uh, scraped them a bit and so forth, painting them, someone who lived in the block of flats said to me, oh, isn't it bright? Lovely and white, looks like ice cream. And sure enough, it did look like ice cream. Only about three or four weeks later after I finished, because I knew of this man who lived in the block of flats, I went to see him and I cringed because that which had looked like ice cream had now the beginnings already of a green stuff coming through. And it wasn't something that complements ice cream either. It was a moldy texture coming through. I hadn't prepared the surface of the wall properly. Actually, in fairness to me, I had asked at a decorating center and they said, no, you don't need anything other than just scrape it back a little bit. That's fine. I needed a stabilizer. I needed to prepare it with a stabilizer, but I hadn't done it. And so all the old stuff uh, started to come through. Need proper preparation. I once worked with a builder in one of my many trades that I've done. I once worked with a builder. Uh, I won't give his name, but we'll call him for ease. We'll call him Cuthbert. Cuthbert the Builder, there you go. Cuthbert the Builder. And he was in charge. Uh, to my frustration, what I found was that working with Cuthbert the Builder, he never sat down beforehand and calculated not only the cost, but the requirements, the materials, the things that would be needed for the job. And so each and every day we'd start off having to go to the builder centre or having to go to 
brewers or somewhere else to get more supplies. And even in the middle of the day, oh, hang on, down tools, let's go now and drive to the builder center again. We need one of these, we need one of those. He never, ever seemed to be prepared, was never really ready to do the job properly. And in these verses that we read this morning, I put to you that it's clear that they're about preparation. They're about preparation. And preparation in Mark's gospel is big. It's big. It's a word preparation he only uses five times. And each time it's for something big. The first time he uses the word preparation in the Greek is right at the beginning of his gospel. When you read of John the Baptist being raised up and being told to, and even declaring, prepare the way for the Lord. Prepare the way for the Messiah. Prepare the way for Christ. So even the Lord Jesus, he was telling people to prepare their hearts because Jesus was here. That was the first time. The second time is when in chapter 10, the Lord is talking about the preparations that are going on, even well, going on even then, we could say going on even now in heaven for all God's children, the preparations that are taking place there. But here, in the passage we've just read, in the verses we've just read, it's the final three times that this word preparation is used. It's there three times in these verses. And on the surface, it, it seems like, you know, it's just preparing for yet another Passover. Great time of celebration, for sure. The most holy of the Jewish festivals, for sure. But it's just another Passover. But actually, what is going to take place, we might say, today, is preparations that began back in eternity and have their fulfillment, are beginning to have their fulfillment. If we enter into the times, if we're listening to Jesus as he sends those disciples out, preparations that are now coming to their fulfillment today, this very hour. The ultimate Passover sacrifice. That's what's being prepared. And we can say that when the Lord makes preparation, even for eternity, when the Lord makes preparation, there's no mistakes. There's nothing forgotten. Nothing forgotten. So let's consider these verses with a heading, first of all, of Mission Impossible. Mission impossible. You know the accounts in the Gospels that Jesus first of all said to the twelve, go out, go out. I've got a mission for you. Go out in twos. And he did the same with the 72. They were sent out in twos. And they were given a mission. And when they came back, it was mission accomplished. We have another mission impossible. Another one. Because in verse 13, it says that he sent two of his disciples, two of his disciples, uh, to go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And of course, it goes on to say that you're to go to a room and make preparations for the Passover in the room. Now, some people looking at that and knowing something of uh, New Testament times and what life was like in Jerusalem will say, well, that's going to be easy because you walk around and it's women who carry the water. So you a man carrying water, that will stand out. Say so. That may or may not be true. But according to the historian Josephus, Writing of a Passover time in the, um, the, the 60s, as it were, 60s AD, he speaks of his estimation that something like two and a half million people descended on Jerusalem for the Passover celebration. You see, it was one of the three festivals, and indeed the most important one, where wherever you were as a Jew, you were to gather, you were to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. So can you imagine, you've got the ordinary citizens of Jerusalem, and then you've got millions, two and a half million, according to Josephus, 
might be an exaggeration, but certainly you've got a massive number of people flooding into Jerusalem. Jesus said to them, go, go. Put yourself in their shoes, the two that have gone, they get to the city. Well, all he said was, was go. Well, what street should we go down? Where way should we go? He just said the city. I know, I know. Let's try the area where the pool of Siloam is. People gather water there. Maybe we'll see this man there. Oh, I say go. Gosh, look at all these people. It is me. How, how are we going to find? How are we going to find anyone? We, you know, there's people pushing and shoving, and there's so many people. How are we going to find them? What's that? Mission Impossible. I know I didn't do it very well. <laughs> Mission Impossible. Have you ever watched Mission Impossible? If you watch anything like that, like Bond, really, you, you know that it's it's all going to be completed. Mission accomplished. Yes, there's going to be these hard things and so forth, but it's going to be completed. It will be at the end, mission accomplished. And you could always say, if you watch one of them, just like with Bond, if you watch one of them, you've watched all of them. You've watched all of them. Seen it all before. Now we come to this passage of scripture. And don't you get a sense of deja vu? Don't you get a sense of, hang on up. Read something like this before, You've seen something like this before. You're you're one of the disciples there with Jesus. Perhaps not one of the two that's being sent on this mission impossible, but you're one of the disciples there, and you're you're hearing Jesus saying, go into the city, etc. Where did he say something similar? If you flip back a couple of chapters or so to chapter 11, it's as Jesus approached Jerusalem. Look at the words there, as they approached Jerusalem. They came to the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go, go to the village ahead of you. And this is where I was going to use the ESV, because actually, if we were Greek scholars and reading this in Greek, we would see that in chapter 11 and in chapter 14, there are 11 Greek words that follow on exactly the same one after the other. And so where Jesus says here, in review in chapter 11, in the end of verse 1, Jesus sent two of his disciples. Actually, in Greek, it would be he, which he ESV gives us, <laughs> he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to that. And those 11 words in Greek are identical with what we have in chapter 14. The difference comes in the one, they're to go to the village, and in the two, they're to go to the city. That's the only difference. The first one, of course, is the triumphal entry. The Lord Jesus Christ going into Jerusalem, and he comes towards the end of his earthly ministry, as he comes towards what many would call the Passion Week. In the first, the mission there is to collect a tied up colt, remember? To collect a tied up colt. Let it fetch that. And when Jesus says to them, if anyone should, if you should face any opposition, you have a mighty weapon that you can use. You know what the mighty weapon is? Jesus says, tell them the Lord needs it. The mighty weapon, there's someone at the door, by the way. The mighty weapon is none other than the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the name high overall, the name high overall, the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mighty weapon. I didn't know that someone's gone. We have a slight pause here for anyone on the internet. Someone's just come to the door and. Uh, Several people are going to answer it. <laughs> Good morning. Put you on the spot. <laughs> okay, just a slight pause. Uh, but we're, we're looking at Mark 14, okay? And we're considering the preparations for the Lord's Supper. 
and we're just we're relatively near the start and we're considering uh, so it's mark 14 verses 12 to 16 and we're just considering how jesus is sending two of his disciples to make preparations and i was making a comparison if you know if you know your bible making the comparison with the triumphal entry which is in mark chapter 11 and saying how in greek there's 11 words that are identical 11 words the same and it's only when you get to the word village or city here that there's a difference and in the first it's the triumphal entry and there's a fetch this cult if there's any opposition that's where we got to if there's any opposition you have this mighty weapon the name of jesus and then they will let you bring the cult and that's exactly what happens mission accomplished mission accomplished you see there when the lord makes preparations there's no mistakes nothing is forgotten and here where we are now in mark 14 if you turn back to there in verses 13 to 16 where jesus says uh, again he sent two of his disciples telling them go into the city and the preparations that they're to make you come to verse 16 the disciples left went into the city found things just as jesus had told them and so they prepared the passover though it's a mission impossible when the lord makes preparations there's no mistakes nothing is forgotten and so those disciples could come back to the Lord and the rest of the disciples and say, Do you know what? Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. So we have mission impossible, but mission impossible is accomplished. Secondly, we have the Lord controlling all events. The Lord Jesus Christ controls Events, says our second heading, the Lord Jesus Christ controls events. You say, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. I want to come back to this mission impossible. You're talking about mission impossible. And I, I get and see the, the similarities there in chapter 11 and chapter 14. And I can ask myself, well, hang on. I can say to myself, they're there for a reason. Because the Bible never repeats itself without there being a reason. The Bible never puts anything there without there being a reason. There's nothing trivial. It doesn't tell us about the weather unless we need to know about the weather. So it's repeated for a reason. I get that. But when it comes to you saying the 12 and the 72, a mission impossible, I can understand that being impossible because they were to drive out demons. So it's only through the Lord working in them in a miraculous way that they could actually do such a thing. Get that. But, but yeah, why call it a mission impossible? They're just collecting a donkey. They're just meeting a man. But my answer or my response to that would be to say, or to put a question back, what makes it a mission impossible? What makes it a mission impossible? It's not the task that they're given. All they're to do is to go and meet a man, if we deal just now with this one, they're just to go and meet a man, ask him, and then follow him, and then when they get to the room, it's going to be all prepared in many ways anyway. They've just got to finish off things in accordance with what's desired. There's no miracle in that. There's nothing impossible about that. But the mission impossible is that it will, and does indeed, turn out exactly as the Lord Jesus Christ predicts. That's impossible. That's impossible. You see, the aim of Mark, this is why he repeats using the same words to show us this. The aim of Mark is to, to make us see, to bring us to see what the disciples experience. And that is that the Lord Jesus Christ controls the events. He controls all events. In verse 14, we read there, they're to meet this man and to, um, and to follow him. And then they're to say to the owner of the house when he enters, the teacher asks, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? 
Now, I used to look at that at one time and think, could it have been an angel that they met? Was it an angel? And think, wow, that's amazing. That they might have met an angel, that the Lord sent an angel there. But I'll tell you what, I don't think it was an angel. But I think because it wasn't an angel, that makes it even greater. It makes it even greater. Because come back to this idea of two and a half million people descending on Jerusalem for the Passover. That's an awful lot of people. I have a friend who lives on the Wirral. And many years ago, he said to me, when there's an open, that's snooker, isn't it? When there's a, no, a cricket, that's the one. When there's a golf open there, uh, Hoy Lake, it's so popular that you could actually hire out, you could rent your house out for the week of the open and make several thousand pounds. I actually looked, because I was trying to, you know, I got that right, he got that right, look at the venue. And actually there's one coming this July and open at Hoy Lake. Hoy Lake? Is Hoy Lake? Yeah, Hoy Lake. And open there in July. And already it seems it's sold out, so it's very popular. You see, People descend on that area. And if you live there, what you can do, and people do it, they, they rent out their house and they go off on holiday for a few days. And they come back and they've made a load of money and had a free holiday. It's a bad idea, isn't it? Well, think about two and a half million people. You know we're going to descend on Jerusalem every year for the Passover. What are they looking for? It's on the tabernacle, the Feast of Tabernacles, where they all put tents up. This is Passover. They want somewhere to stay, somewhere to lay their head. And so there's going to be a demand for property, a demand for rooms. And what I put to you, what Mark is showing us here, is what the proverb writer tells us, that the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. In other words, it's talking about kings there, but we can apply it to all people. The Lord controls not only events, but the heart of man, the heart of woman, the heart of child. He can turn a person wheresoever he will. He can turn a, a pharaoh, as it were. He can turn a, a bad man into a good man. And so he controls the heart. And he can cause a man in a time of great demand to withhold, renting out his room so that it can be given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Some people uh, like to, to speculate and say how Jesus must have arranged all these things before one, but that completely misses the point. Completely misses the point. The idea here is we're to see that the Lord Jesus Christ controls events. There's a famous testimony, isn't there, of a baker who says he went to bed he didn't bump his head, but he didn't wake up before the morning because the Lord woke him up with this one thought in his mind. I've got to bake bread for George Muller's children. And so he got up before dawn and he baked lots and lots of bread. And he delivered it to the Muller house where he had all these orphan children. There, and they were sat down giving thanks for their food, but there was nothing on the table. Muller and his wife and whoever was helping him had nothing to feed them with. But Muller said, nevertheless, we'll pray, we'll give thanks. By the time they finished giving thanks, not, 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 not there it was. There's all the fresh bread, ready for the children to eat. You see, the Lord controls all events. The Lord moves the heart to do his will. In verse 16, the disciples left. They went into the city, found things just as Jesus had told them. And so they prepared the Passover. If it was the Cold War again, as we mentioned last week, and you're an agent in the field, an agent in the field is, has got to be ready to make alterations, haven't they? To sudden changes and things like that. What about if, if the, the, the plan fails? What are you going to do then? Here. Here. The Lord controls all events. They found it just as Jesus had told them. He controls all events. Mission accomplished. Well, the disciples were about their master's business. 
So, and this is my third reading, the Lord Jesus Christ is about his father's business. We go back to the start of the chapter and thinking what we were looking at last week, how it is that the Passover there was two days away in verse one, the chief priests, the teacher of the law, are looking for some sly way to arrest Jesus and to kill him. Again, cold war. Cold war. If it was cold war and they're after capturing someone's sly way, it reminds you of all that stuff, doesn't it? Espionage and uh, this kind of thing and peeking out behind walls and all the rest of it. If Jesus was not trusting fully in his father, what would he be doing? Hiding away. Covering his tracks. That place called Gethsemane, which was a delightful place for the Lord Jesus Christ to go and pray, would only be known to the innermost three, wouldn't it? Peter, James, and John. The rest of the disciples wouldn't know, just in case one of them actually took up what's going on there in verse one, heard about these bandits, thought he did, and thought, I'll give him up. Which, of course, he did. But the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't hide him, doesn't cover his tracks. Indeed, he comes into Jerusalem, and what's the first thing he does when he comes into the temple area? He makes a name for himself, doesn't he, by saying, this is outrageous what you're doing in the temple grounds, making it into a marketplace. He overturns their tables. But you see, the Lord Jesus Christ could do all this because as to his humanity, as to his humanity, he believed by faith that when the Father makes preparation, there's no mistakes, nothing is forgotten. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, with faith and confidence, can be about his Father's business. Here, in chapter 11, everywhere, the divine plan God's divine plan, in, even down to the minute, intricate details, the preparations, they're perfect. they're perfect. Perfect preparations for this time, as we're reading this morning, even preparations that were put in place in eternity past. When the Father makes preparation, there's no mistakes. Nothing is forgotten. So the Lord Jesus Christ is about his Father's business. And these verses that we've read this morning, they're about far greater things than uh, an annual Passover sacrifice celebration. It's already been hinted at when we saw last week in verses 8 and 9, where this lady uh, pours perfume on his body, preparing for burial. Now she's preparing the Lord Jesus Christ for his own sacrifice. In verse 15, so she's hinting at it here with anointing his body, preparing it for burial. And in verse 15, we will read, we read, he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready, make preparations for us there. And that room is where the Lord Jesus Christ will make preparations for his own sacrifice. What was the Passover for? The Passover was to remember the escape from slavery. Of course, it took place, didn't it? That night, the Israelites escaped. They left the captivity, the slavery of Egypt. They came out. The angel of death passed over those who had the blood on the doorpost, which was the Israelites. And they were rescued. The Lord delivered them from slavery. Mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. But now, in this, what we might call last Passover, 
The Passover for the Christian is to be replaced with the Lord's Supper. Doesn't mean to say we can't benefit from what took place with the original Passover and all that's taken place with that. Of course we do. We do. But now our celebration is a different one. We don't celebrate the Passover. We celebrate the Lord's Supper. That's what they remembered the Passover, the original Passover, which brought them out of captivity, of slavery. We remember in the Lord's Supper the ultimate sacrifice. All the preparations of history are fulfilled in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here on this night, oh, like no other, the Lord Jesus Christ would be about his father's business. But then fourthly, we can consider the care of the Lord. The care of the Lord. How it is that the Lord cares for his people. The care he makes in preparing for our salvation. And we scratch our head. Not because we've got an itch, but because we, well, we've got an itch, an itch in our mind. Actually, that's quite nice. We've got an itch in our mind. We've got an itch in our mind. It makes me itch. Oh. <laughs> we, how were the Jews missing? They had all this symbol, all these rituals given to them, on top of the pile of everything they were given, the most holy sacrifice of all, we might say, the most holy festival of all, of all was the Passover one. How did they miss it? It's all pointing to the preparations for salvation. You ask, well, don't do that again. You ask, how did they miss it? How did they miss it? All the Old Testament history. Could they not see the real meaning of the Passover. Can you see the real meaning of the Passover? Can you see what it points to? Blood on the doorpost of your house means that the angel of death will pass over. There'll be no slaying, as it were, of anyone inside where blood covers the house. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, a sacrifice. For sin, sin, and covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The time, the time of this event, the time of Jesus' coming, the night on which he'll be betrayed, the time in which he will be wrongly convicted and nailed to a cross and crucified, and the time he will be sacrificed. Oh, poor Jew, can you not see? Poor you if you don't see. This is not chance. It's not a chance thing. That's unusual, peculiar. It should fall at the same time as they have a, a sacrificial meal, remembering the sacrifice of the lamb, a lamb that's spoken of right throughout scripture, and a lamb that's uh, really, is it possible for the blood of bulls and goats and rams even to take away sin? That's our real problem. It's not chance. Any Jew would know there's no such thing as chance. Think of Jerusalem that day, 2.5 million, if we take Josephus of his word, 2.5 million descended on there with one thought in their mind. One word in sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice. 2.5 million people plus Jesus is here. Jesus is here. And if there was one word on their mind as they were coming, sacrifice, there's one question on the heart at that time, I don't doubt, of all the Jewish people. Who is Jesus of Nazareth? Could he be the Christ? Could he really be the Christ? When the Lord makes preparations, there's no mistakes. Nothing is forgotten. And the timing of this, there's other things we can, other ways we can apply this, but here for us this morning, the timing of this event is to show to the Jews and to show to the whole world that Jesus is the true 
the only Lamb of God who can take away the sin of the world. What does a tutor do? What does a tutor do? Tutor prepares you for life. If you're a tutor, if you're a school teacher, you're preparing a child for life. It's an incredible privilege, isn't it? Wonderful task to prepare someone for life. He is a tutor preparing someone for their life to come. Now, if, if the law was our tutor, as Paul tells us in Galatians, if the law was our tutor, what's the most important lesson that the tutor can teach? What's the most important lesson? When I was at school, one ten is ten, two ten is twenty, three ten to thirty, four ten to forty, and you do that with all the times tables. And, and actually, by the age of nine, I was an expert. Yeah, I, there's a word I wouldn't use lightly, but I, in my own humble opinion, <laughs> I was proud of that one. Huh? But I, I was fast at doing the tables. Sevens and eights, even those awkward ones. Sixes were my favourite. I was fast at doing them. How's that? Well, because it was repetition. It was repeated uh, with a, a kind of a rhyming voice, just as you did with the ABC as well, wasn't it? A, B, C, D, you know, all that sort of stuff. I don't know whether they changed it. No, they probably have. But, but that's how it was. And the repetitiveness meant that you learned these things. They went in there. The law is the schoolmaster. What's the tutor do? Prepares us for the life to come. What's the most important lesson? The law as the tutor can bring to us. It's repeated over and over every year with the Passover. You know, the, the way the celebration would take place, the family would come together and there would be the father or the lead male of the house and uh, divided into four parts, the meal was. Uh, but at the start, at the beginning of it, the youngest son, he'd obviously been, um, you know, primed for this with the right words. He even got it down, I don't know. Remember to read backwards because that's how we write it and so forth. And there he is, and, and he's, he's, he's got to ask the question. Well, why is this day different to every other? Ah, and then the lead of the house starts to expound and explain the Passover events and so forth. And so this, and even, even down to what they were eating, the bitter herbs and the lamb and all this, everything had a, a meaning and a purpose. And then the male would explain all these things. That's repeated again and again, so that you get it into your mind. And if the lead male was a true believer, they'd want it in your heart. Repeated over and over, the Passover, to remind them of the deliverance from slavery, to teach. To teach that God, that God is victory. He is victory. Mission accomplished. But then we can go further. If we would have, because the law is uh, the schoolmaster, the tutor, to bring us to Christ. That's what Galatians says. The law, I think it's Galatians 3.23, if you're looking for it. The law was our tutor to bring us to Christ. There's a guardian in the NIV, but it, it's tutor, schoolmaster, guardian, custodian, I think is the right word, to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. That's what the law is doing. And if we would have life to come, we need the Lamb of God to deliver us from sin. The blood of the Passover Lamb stained the doorposts. At the cross, the blood of Christ removes the stain of sin from the heart of everyone who will ever believe. You can't get better than that. You cannot. And so preparation. Think of preparation. You know, the one preparation with all that's been said, the one preparation you don't need, that's heart preparation. Don't be like Cuthbert, because if you're like Cuthbert, trying to make your heart ready so that you can come to Christ, you'll never get to the end of your preparation. You'll, you'll never do it right. You'll never get it right. 
come as you are. You come as you are. That's what you do. You come as you are. How do you come? To Christ. As Savior. And as Lord. Saw it on the pictures, didn't we, earlier? The world promises so much and doesn't deliver. Doesn't deliver the iPhone. It delivers instead. What was it? Captain. Captain. Face masks instead of a camera. Those are some of the things that, that's just a, a gimmicky way of looking at it. But, but in reality, the world doesn't deliver. It's only the Lord Jesus Christ who delivers. And he delivers from sin. And his blood removes the stain of all our sins. You come as you are. Don't be a comfort. Come to Jesus. If you have not done so, in repentance and faith. And finally, just to consider these things, believer. Not only did the Lord Jesus Christ prepare for your salvation, but he prepares for your life too. All the preparations are there for your life. We read in uh, Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. Many people like to quote that and just uh, plans to prosper you and give you a future and a hope and, and, and stop it there. But actually, if you read the passage, if you look at the passage, it's a letter to the exile. They're in exile because of their sins. And the full passage says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When? When you seek me with all your heart, thank you. When you seek me with all your heart, that is when. Now that was applied to the Jews in exile, but it can be applied to us today. For us, for them, the key word there, it's not just, oh, we can do as we want. God has got wonderful plans for us, which is how it's often put today. We must seek him. He must seek him. Remember last week, last week when we started the passage and we saw how it was in verse one that the uh, chief priests and so on, they were looking for some sly way to arrest and kill Jesus. And that word looking for is seeking. And it's that word that links with it's the same word as seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So there's a, a passion there, isn't there? There's a, a hunger there. If you're really seeking for something, it's before all else. Before all else. Our life. The Lord prepares for our life, but he calls upon us to seek him before all else. Seek first his kingdom. But I've got all these worries about this and that. Never mind all those things. He is. The one who controls all events. He will meet your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But you seek him. You seek him and none other. And when you seek him, you find him. he will provide. The care of the Lord, he will provide. And then sometimes we begin, we have plans. Uh, we make preparations even, and we begin something, and then we start to doubt whether we can succeed, whether it actually will be a mission accomplished or not. You know, often, if it's our plans, then it does fail, doesn't it? If it's our plans, it does fail. But not if it's the Lord's plan. Because when the Lord has something for us, when the Lord makes preparation for us, there's no mistakes. Nothing will be forgotten. And it isn't an easy part. We know that it's a tough part. In this world, we will have trouble. But the one who controls all events has overcome the world. So we can go forth with confidence, with faith in the one who controls all events. So even though sometimes we may face something and we can say, well, that's a mission impossible. That's a mission impossible. Because the Lord is in control. He makes that which is impossible. He makes it possible. The Lord Jesus Christ was about his father's business. Are we? Are we? 
Think of witnessing. We sang it in a couple of the hymns there, didn't we? Sung about the need to witness. Think about witnessing. We might say, in some situations, especially mine, it's a, it's a mission impossible. But you see, when the Lord makes preparations, there's no mistakes. Nothing is forgotten. Wherever we are, whatever the situation, however um, cold people saw, however much people reject the truth and so forth, the Lord has his people. He has his elect, and he will draw them. Our mission is not to sort of look and say, well, I don't think that one's called of God. I don't think that one's elect or whatever. Our mission is to go and preach to all, preach him to all. That's what we're to do. Trusting that the Lord will bring the hearts. Lord Therefore, we can go knowing that it will be a mission accomplished. And then when we come to church, when we come together, when we come to pray, when we come on the Lord's day, do we prepare our hearts for worship? Or do we come in cold, expecting, you know, things to take place towards us? For sure, the Lord can do that, does do that, but he also says that we should prepare. We should prepare. We talk about uh, having a little bit of heaven on earth. Oh, bring it with you. Bring it with you. That's what we should be doing, isn't it? So that we can spark off one another. As it and not only that, but do we prepare ourselves for the lives that we're to live? Is that a holiness? How do we prepare? Do we prepare ourselves for the day with prayer? All these things, you can add to that list. I've just given you a few. But all that we would do, all that we seek to do, it will be no mission accomplished without that we pray, without that we bring it all before the Father. And then finally, just thinking of this, preparations. When the Lord makes preparations, there's no mistakes. Nothing is forgotten. The Lord Jesus Christ, he said he was going. He was going back to heaven. What was he going back to heaven for? He was going back to heaven to prepare a place for you, for me, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. He was going to prepare a place so that at the end of our lives, each and every one of us shall be carried to heaven. Mission. Amen. Mm -hmm.